Hello, this is Dr. James Holt with Washington State University's Engineering and Technology Management Program. I've been very concerned about helping organizations get to become effective organizations for quite a long time. And I've arrived at a situation which I call visual project management. In other words, how can we see how to get things done? You know, first of all, I'd like to review before we get into the solution, what organizations look like. At the top of the organization is the leader, the CEO. This guy is up the top. His role is to set the vision for the company and then convince everybody else in the company that that's the way that they should go and motivate them to achieve those goals. Now, the CEO is in a pretty important position, but the direction they go is the one that is important because it's going to take the whole company. On the other side of the scale is the guys at the bottom. and These are the guys that do the work. And their job is, is to do the work in the order that it's been assigned. And they need to know their status of their work to know if they're doing good or not. And they need to know when and where to go to get help to do their work. And right now, at least, there's a lot of people who are out there who would love to take jobs at that level and just get things done and have some good employment. So there's not a shortage of either the top or the bottom. There's lots of people who would like to be the CEO. There's like to pe a lot of people who can work at the bottom. But in the middle is the difficult group. It's the management group. It's the group who decides how do we get all the workers to go in the direction that our CEO wants us to go. So they have to decide how to make that thing work, what to do, when to do it, and particularly when to give help. So the workers on the bottom need to know when to ask for it, the worker, and the workers in the middle know, need to know when to give it. We notice that these people are focusing on resources, money, time, energy, schedules, and in the long-term trend and of the system. The mid-level management has become a problem. When it was first invented, when there was cost accounting and all that stuff that happened around the 1900s with GM and, and their vehicles, uh, the mid-level management group started becoming more and more important. Because of the mid-level management group, the bottom at the worker level has become the most efficient people in the world. The United States still leads the world in efficiency per, per man unit at the bottom primarily because of the effectiveness of these mid-level managers. The cost of mid-level managers has now become more, uh, more so probably than the cost of the workers, just because that's the nature of business. The mid-level managers makes things go. The difficulty is that those mid-level managers' time is becoming more and more limited, their ability to concentrate on the things which need to be done. And particularly when it talks about project management, because these guys are doing projects. And in projects, there's a lot of difficulties. And you need to do it right to become very efficient and effective. So what is a project? Well, as a project is something that you do so that somebody else can do something else. In other words, you do it so that you can help somebody else do something else. It's an intermediate part. It's if you think about it, it's a small segment out of a supply chain. So we build a house so that people can live in it. We make a radio so people can listen to the news and so on. And all those things that I've got listed there, bridge to get on the other side. We process insurance claims so that we receive our restitution and we run for public office so that we can improve the world. Yep, that's why they do that. And uh, we need to test, uh, treat a patient so they'll have good health. All those things are projects. In fact, they're everywhere. If you're in any big city in the United States and you look upside of those big, tall buildings, what do you think they're doing in those buildings? Are they doing mass production? Are they making cars or widgets or radios? Probably not. They're working on things which are projects, things which go from one person to another to another, and there's a lot of people working together to make something happen. If you ever had an insurance claim, you know there's a whole bunch of people involved. As a result, it's my belief that really most everybody is doing projects. If you're not doing mass production, you're doing projects. And these projects have uh, difficult skills with them. You know, to an outsider, a project is kind of strange. It's sort of like a black hole. You put your project in there, and then sooner or later it comes out. Here's a man who says, I'd like a house. He has a vision of what he wants. He turns it over to the people who are developing it. And over time, the system develops and develops, and sooner and sooner and later, the product comes out. And sometimes it's not exactly what he wanted. Customer's a little disappointed, particularly not happy, but at least he's got something that came out of the big black hole. If you work in the black hole, it's a little different. There's usually two types of people in the black hole. 
there's the angry, mean project managers, the ones with the frowny faces along the top, and they have colored faces. That's, that's different colors come from depending on how long you've been holding your breath because you're so angry. And then there's the one on the left side, which is the workers. The workers are all smiling because they went to school and they learned how to do their projects and they, they, they do this job because they love to do things, do projects. The problem is that the mean and angry project managers are all trying to get their projects done and they have to depend upon these resources to get them done. And so the project managers, depending on every moment in time, the workflow goes around between workers and projects and so on. And then it ends up, you say, gosh, you never know from any particular moment, like this moment in time, uh, that, that person here has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, 12, 13, 14, 15 different items he has to do this week and the average is only five. He's got three times the normal workload that he should have and this other guy up here only has two. So he underloaded. Everybody knows that, that there's sometimes they don't have enough work to do. And so the project manager will put more stuff on and as a, and as a consequence people get overloaded. This is a problem. But the problem, real problem is when you ask the guys in the black hole, the ones working there, when's the project going to come out, they really don't know because the amount of work in process goes up and down. And as a consequence, nobody's happy. The workers are not happy because they can't do their job right. The project managers are not happy. And the customer's not happy. Nobody knows when it's going to come out, not management, not the workers. Sometime it will come out. Such a disappointing thing for project world. What we need is a solution. The direction of the solution means we need to keep these projects, get them going so they go flow through our processes. We need to keep them flowing so they keep, you know, once we get them started, they need to keep going so that they don't slow down. One of the big problems is we need to know what to worry about and what not to worry about because you can worry about the wrong things and mess things up. Also, you need to know what a good enough status is. You don't need to know everything about a project. You just need to know, is this thing working? Is it going in the right direction? And we need, most of all, to be predictable. If we can be predictable, then people will be happy to wait for their house because they know they're going to get it on the 17th of July. And they can plan for that date. It may be longer than they want, but they know when they're going to get it. So predictability is probably one of the most important tools in projects. Over the years, I've studied many different tools for trying to improve projects. The best, best tools that I could find come from PERT, CPM, Lean, Six Sigma, and the Theory of Constraints. When we put those things together, we realize that projects have to have control over the precedence. They have to control the critical path. They have to do the right thing at the right time and avoid doing the wrong things. We have to you know, do the flow thing. We want to have visual control so we can analyze it and process it and measure it and all that stuff. We need to focus on what really needs to be done and stop doing the stuff which doesn't. We want to aggregate all this stuff together so we have realistic schedules. All of these are great things. Hold back some reserve capacity, protect our resources with some buffers. All those are the elements of, of good project management based upon these principles. The difficulty is those things are too hard, too complicated, too restrictive. Involved takes a lot of questionable reporting gets involved and there's a lot of computer reports and maintenance and all that thing. It's just not worth it for the day-to-day -day routine projects that people do. It's just too much for 99%, 90% at least, of the project world. Because remember, everybody in all those high-rise buildings are doing projects, as well as the ones you're doing at home and with your Boy Scouts and everything else. So my proposal is that we provide the best management tools for the masses for projects which will include all of the best management techniques we've gleaned from all these improvements that we've made over the years. We're going to eliminate all the problems that go along with projects. We're going to deliver fast and predictable and have a process that delivers, that develops the people who are doing the project management so they become better project managers and better people all at the same time. And the bottom line is when this happens, everybody will agree on what's happening and everybody will be happy. What an amazing thought for project management. Who would have thought? I call this thing visual project management. Let me explain a little bit of what it is. Visual project management is ideal when the 
purpose of the doing the project is to get it done. That is to get the right content done at the right time. So the project is best when it's managed by a relatively small group of people, at least in visual project management. And so it fits more onto a skinny project, one that's kind of long and has just a few feeder tasks. If you have a fat project like putting man on the moon or uh, building satellites, you probably don't want to use visual project management. You need something a little more robust, but come on. Most of the things we do in these high-rise buildings are not putting people on the moon. If your organization is not quite ready to put people on the moon and do those fat projects, a good place to start is doing visual project management until you get the skills needed in order to just move over to that more mature project management tool. The elements of visual project management are simple. One, you need a plan. This can be a simple plan. It can be a PERT diagram. It can be a, a CCPM plan, or it can be a critical chain plan. It could be just a list of projects you need, things you need to do, a list of tasks that you need to do on uh, went be on to get yourself on vacation, okay? That's all you need, but it needs to be a firm and aggressive plan. Once you make this plan, it's gonna, the order's gonna stay pretty much the same, and you're gonna give it a sign of time to each one of these tasks on your plan. And that time should be something that you think you can get about 50, 50, 50 percent of the time. That's what an aggressive means, or at least it's gonna be a push to get it on that time, but you think you might be able to. You take that plan after you have it and you add up all the timeline on the critical chain or the critical path or the, if you just have a list of tasks then add up how many days or hours is this going to take. After you get that number you divide it in half and put 50% of that on the bottom as a project time buffer. Very simple. Figure out how much time it's going to take and add 50% on the bottom. That's your safety factor because you used an aggressive schedule to start with. And then you're going to frequently report when something gets completed. As soon as it's completed, you report it to the system so the PIST system gets updated and we know the status of things. We're not guessing that something is halfway done or 50% done or 90% done. We all know that when something's 90% done, what that means is you spent 90% of the money you had to do that project, but it may take you quite a bit longer to get it done. So we're just going to report things which actually get completed. That's simple. The fourth category here says we need to have some expert resource backup. I call it an expert resource bench. And 20% seems to be about right for many of the research elements that I've done. These resources are people who know your project world, but they sit back and watch. They're the senseis, the fire uh, marshals, the SWAT team that come in and help whenever there's a problem. They help when there's a buffer management problem, they help when there's a training problem, they come in and diagnose things which need to be done in your in your organization and to, for the overall benefit of the organization. So if you think about it, they're the teachers and trainers of the organization. How are we going to do this then? simple. You just follow those steps. You make a plan, you put 50% buffer at the end, you record the completed tasks. And if needed, you give help. If somebody's in trouble, you give help. If they are not, if they don't need help, then don't give them help. Just help them when they need it. And if they need it, the SWAT team can come in there and help, or you may have some other management resources. But if they don't need it, the SWAT team just watches and says, hmm, sure seems like they're having trouble putting that thing together but they're not in, the overall project's not in trouble, so let's just think about that for a while. And we need to control the release of the work. That means don't give your employees too much work. And we'll show you how to control that in a minute. If you overload people and you give somebody, can you just sign your name to this document? Sure, that only takes a moment. But if you say, here's another one, another one, another one, while they're signing, all the papers pile up, and how long will it take them to get it all straight? You don't know. So. Just give them the work at the rate that they can do it. Let's show you an example here of how it would work. Here's a skinny project. The skinny project has a start and a duration. So you can see here that it's going to be starting here and it's that long and it has its 50% buffer on the end. Because of this, we, we know that the critical chain or the critical path or just the sum of the list of things to do takes about that long. And the 50% buffer is half of that. If we take a look at the clock and say this is now, 
started here, and this is now, and it's supposed to be that long, we can easily calculate what percentage of the time of the project has been completed. Now minus the start time divided by the length of that line tells us what percentage of time the project was, how much of it's been done so far, or the time has been used, consumed so far. Now, if we've only completed to here, because that's the, the red first one got completed, then we know, hmm, we can calculate how many completed tasks did we have along the critical chain. We only had that one right there. And then we divide it by the time and we can say what percentage of the project has been completed to this particular moment in time. If the time still goes forward and we haven't completed anything newer, the percent complete still stays the, stays the same. Once we have this, hmm, we can figure out a lot of things. But you know, it's pretty easy because we know the length of the project, we know when we started it, and so the only thing we need to, to uh, we also know what now is, so that's, so we know almost everything. The only thing we have to do for visual project management is to know which elements have been completed. That's the only thing that's important. The only thing that's important in project is what's done. Whether you have things that need to be done, that's not so important. What's finished? That's the important question of the day. When we examine the gap between now and where what's been completed, we, we say, hmm, there's a gap. This gap is represented by buffer penetration. We have consumed some of our safety. The percentage of this buffer safety can easily be calculated. The first one is, is that long, and the other one's that long, and this protection. So a simple 10% um, consumption in here this, if this gap is 10% of the length, over here it's 20% of the length. And so it's just two times the difference between the percentage of the time consumed and the percentage minus the percentage of the buffer completed, excuse me, the project completed. So this gives us a very simple equation to calculate this. Now, the way we plot it is we put it on a chart. We call this a fever chart. I like to see this fever chart that's just about twice as wide as it is tall because the length of time across the bottom is proportional to the length of the safety, which is the vertical element. On the bottom is project completion percentage, and on the side is pro project of buffer consumed. We don't want to be consuming a lot of buffer too soon. And so this now gives us a good descriptor of how we should work on our project. What we see is that that we've completed our project to now, to, excuse me, we've completed our project to this point, which gives us that amount of percent completed, and we've used this much of our buffer. We put that in here, and so now we have a dot on our screen that tells us we're this far over on our project and we're this far over on our buffer consumption. And so, are we in trouble? Are we? No, we're in the green. We're, we're okay. We don't need any help. We're, we're surviving. Now, just because uh, this is a new concept, let's go through plotting a project over the time of the project just to see how it goes. So here we are at time zero. We haven't started the project yet, so we haven't consumed any time. That's zero. We haven't consumed any project buffer. The project hasn't, is 0% uh, complete, so we've got buffers consumed is 2 times 0 minus 0 or 0, so we have a red dot right over there. Are we in trouble? Oh, I don't think so. So now we zoom over a little bit. We've completed uh, to f four days. We've consumed four days. We've completed three days worth of work out of 20. We've got 20% uh, of our time has been consumed and 15% of our project's been completed. So we calculate our buffer consumption. It's 2 times 20 minus 15 or 10%. Uh, for those of you who want to worry about the slope of this line, you can say, well, th since the last reporting period, we used four time units and we increased the project by three time units. And so the buffer increased just by one, and one divided by the three is less than a half. So we notice that our sloping line, which is a half, we're, we're below that. So we're staying in the green. I'm not going to go over that each time, but you can watch that if you need to. So we're, we, at this particular point, we're OK. We're still in the green. Now moving along, it's now time uh, eight out of 20, 40% of the time consumed, and five days out of 20 of the project has been completed. 
looks like we're getting a little behind, doesn't it? Hmm. The buffer consumed then is 2 times 40 minus 25, or 30. And we'll notice that, gosh, we have had a, a significant, the, the slope of the line for buffer consumption is 2 divided by 2, which is greater than 1. And look what happened to us. We went from the green upwards at a pretty steep slope into the red. So are we in trouble? Yeah, we're in trouble. We're, you're only early in the project, but we know pretty early that we're in trouble. So now we can fix it. So moving along, we've uh, advanced to time 16. We've got 10 days worth of project done, so we can suck, make our calculation, and we've used 60% of our buffer. Ooh, we're still in trouble. The slope of the line's not so bad, but we're still in trouble. Where's our, our expert resource bench to come and help us get, up, get out of here? Going a little bit farther, oh, the bench must have come because now we've used 20 days into the project. 20 days into the project, meaning it now is at the end. We're right at the end. We've used all of the time that we scheduled, but we're only 14 days worth of work done. Hmm, a lot of our buffer is being consumed. We calculate that as 100 minus 70 times 2, 60%. But we're getting closer to the end of the project, so 60% is not such a bad thing. We're in the green again. The goal is to finish the project in the green. Moving along farther, we're now in here. 125% of the project time has been consumed. Yes, the project time is the length of the aggressive schedule. We've added 50% on the end. So we have some extra time left. 17 days out of 20 days of the project's been uh, completed. Uh, our buffer is about 80%. Ooh, it's going back up there, getting a little bit troublesome. Let's see if we can finish off this project before it's done. Time 28 out of 30, 140% of the time. We got uh, one more day, one 19 out of 20%, 95% of the project's done. We're 90% buffer consumed. Gosh, it's getting close. Maybe we'll get it tomorrow. Oh, yes, well, finally. On the day 29, before it was due on day 30, we finished it. So way to go. We finished with a 90% project buffer in place. So that's nice. We were in the green. We made it home. Winning story. The nice thing about an individual project is we can kind of watch from time to time how the project's doing. We notice here, it says, ooh, what happened during this period of time? They made a report and nothing happened. It just consumed a whole bunch of their time where no progress was made on the project. Then we see that sometimes when the individuals are making progress along the project, and it took them a long time to get it back out, but yes, they made some serendipitous advantage there and got back in the green and finished on time. The good thing about the projects is when you finish. You know, the project's really not worth anything if you don't finish. When you finish, you get the ching, that's when the cash register kicks in. Remember, the project is something you do for somebody else. And when they get the project done, typically they're getting 10 times the value of whatever it costs you to do the project. 10 times, 10 to 1. So the person who's getting the project is really happy when it gets done. That's why we want to be fast and predictable. If you have many projects going on, you can see many of them all on one page with just one dot of the current status of those projects. This is a really good deal. Because it, and it can give you many beneficial side effects. For instance, we can see that how many? We see there's four projects which are in trouble. Which ones are they? Can you point them out? Hmm, well, we, yes, we have 14, 1421, 1541, 614, and 644. And we should know, for the management, when there's something in trouble, they should know exactly what it is that's going on. This is great because once you have a visual like this, you can see where everybody stands on all of their projects all at once. Having four projects out of this many in the red is a little bit high, so I hope they can get some of these into the green. Now, we take a look at 1541, who's having trouble. He's close to the end, but he's got trouble. We, we ask, can ask our project management team, is there anybody else who has resources that can help Project 1541. Well, Project Manager 16 says, I have some of those people. So, as a, and I can, I have quite a bit of time before I'm in the red. So, I could actually allow these people 
my people to go and help your people for maybe a week or two before I'm in trouble. And 1541 says, oh, I'll be glad to take your people. So they now work over here and bring this back in the green. And in the meantime, the 16 goes upwards. And so it looks like they're going to be working together to get things done. There are some anomalies that happen. For instance, this one. If you exceed your buffer, which is highly possible and happens quite often, what we'll see is that this project here, 444, and this project, 122, are going to be late. Well, actually, 122 is already late because the time, vertical time, is longer than the horizontal time, so it's, it's already late. But this one, theoretically, one would say, oh, it's not late yet. We have plenty of time left. We can pull it out of the fire. Really? Remember that Project 444 started off down here at the bottom, and after a little while it went up and 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 to get there. So over this whole period of time, the full buffer time, people were trying to put that project back on track, but it was not. So definitely that project is something wrong with it. They're not going to make it. So we need to tell our customer, sorry, we're not going to get that one for you. We're going to freeze it. We'll pull it back out later in time so when maybe we have more resources available or we figure out how to do it. There's another anomaly that we need to mention. That is on the bottom end. Now you would think, hey, that's pretty good. 115 and 700, both of those guys are uh, way ahead of schedule. Happy day, we should applause, right? No, not really. What does that mean when 115 and 700 are are recovering way deep in the green. Hmm. It means that they have scheduled their project longer than it needed to be and means they're holding back the big ka for their customer longer than it needed to be. So this is a problem. We need to get 115 and 700 uh, to schedule a little bit more aggressively perhaps. Or it might be that because of this anomaly, 700 has figured out a new way to do things much, much faster. Now that may be new, but we can go and say, hey, what did you guys do? How did you get, how did you get so much faster? Why don't we learn from you and maybe we can help everybody else be faster too? So whether the anomaly is good or bad, if it's in the green, low in the green, we need to at least look at it from a management perspective. So implementing critical change or visual project management is a fairly simple thing. There's only one additional step that I recommend for you. And that is that when you first start and you look at all the projects that you have in your system, you need to take a look at those and prioritize those. Only put the top ones in first. And when you get to the bottom, you're going to find out that you're probably too fully loaded. Most likely, you're going to have to cut about 25% of the work that's currently in your systems or maybe more out. When, I'm not saying cut it out and throw it away, but you have to cut it out. We use the term freeze. When you don't have enough capacity to do all the work that you've been assigned, does it make sense to keep pouring more stuff in there? No. It's going to take longer and be unpredictable. So we pull it out. We freeze it. You take that work that you know you shouldn't be doing, you remove it from the system, put it in the freezer somewhere, big file cabinet somewhere, and then you watch it. And then you, when your system has reduced its capacity and finished some of the projects that are in there, you look at the most important frozen ones and you pull them back out and stick them in. So we're going to, uh, it's really good to see which ones. If you've got some that are too far in the red and in the black, those are good candidates for freezing. Or maybe they're just low priority work and they shouldn't have been done in the first place. So you start off with the about 75% of your remaining work to get things going, and then you use buffer management to slide resources back between those people who need it the most. What are you going to expect from this? Well, you're going to get a simple visual indicator of the status of your projects. On the left, we see the project status for a single project. You'll see a manager who's worrying about that particular project. And we notice that that manager, when he gets in the red, he should be able to ask for help without question. And actually, the expert research bench is probably on its way over there to help him at that particular moment in time. Or there's somebody in management who is redirecting some resources to get him out of the red. That's what it means to be in the red. Take action to get out of the red. On the right, we see the overall view of all of the projects. 
and then we can see how people can share. Everybody can see everything. And when that happens, we can all agree on what the best action is. It's, you get away from the, this is my project and I have to finish on time or else I won't get promoted thing until you move to the, this is our company and we need to finish our work on time. I need to help Joe and Joe, because I, I can, because I know if I get in the red and I'm going to be late, Joe will be helping me. So this change in management objectives is a significant one that changes the culture of our organization. Now, um, let's talk a little bit about this resource bench. I mentioned it, but I think it's so important that we need to recognize how it should play. The 20% resource bench is extra. They're not just your low paid employees. These are the guys who are the best ones. They know a lot about the projects you're dealing with. What they do is they sit back and sit there and they examine what's going on. They watch and they don't interfere. They don't ask questions. They just look and experience because they know a lot about this thing. Uh, if something goes haywire, they will jump in there and help. They go over to the person who says, oh, I see he's in the red. Let's go help him. Two guys go over there and says, I see you're, you're having trouble put this part together. We, you know, we've done that before. Yeah, I just can't figure out. Every time I put it up here and I try to, it keeps, I can't keep the alignment while I'm trying to put these bolts in. Says, well, we've found that if you turn it over, they'll, it will sit on there and it won't move while you put the bolts in. Oh, really? Oh, wow, thank you very much. And so we come, become expert trainers on the job training. Many of you receive training well in advance of the time you needed it, and then you know that at time you need it, you can't remember what the training was. But when you get just in time training, you've been struggling with a problem as about as much as you can, and then somebody comes and gives you the answer in the right way. Suddenly, you see you learn that very quickly, and at the same time, we let the person struggle and develop as best they can, but when it gets too much, the SWAT team is there to help out. This problem uh, can move things from the green zone into the red zone. The second part of the expert resources bench's time is spent thinking. They just sit around thinking. They're the best guys. They know how the system works and they spend their time watching and looking. And when there's a problem, they sit back and two or three people say, why do you think that happens? Hmm, he's in the green zone, but I think uh, he's having problems. Why does that happen? They try and figure it out. The buffer's really being consumed so rapidly without any progress. You know, we didn't have that problem, did we? Oh yeah, we did sometimes. Well, what's the best thing to do? What's causing the conflict? How can we resolve this system? And they sit and think. And as a result of their thinking, they come up with a solution. The expert resource bench then says, we ought to do this. We, so they write up a report and send it up to the management. Let's change the way we do our processing so that these things happen, training or whatever it is that's a problem. The resource bench then becomes the foundation of the learning organization, which is a critical part for your improvement process. Now, let's suppose you have a special case. You have a project and it's supposed to be done, but when you add the 50% buffer on place, it's going to be way late because the due date is before the end of that 50% buffer. When that happens, your project's in jeopardy before you even start. This is a problem. This happens quite often, by the way, and when people have come in, they, they're late when they come in with their project. How do you deal with that? If you have to do it, it's a necessary condition that you need to have an offset. I call it a pushback. So what we're going to do is say, look, let's push the buffer back in time so that it ends on the due date that you have. And then we can do the calculation even at time zero, we can do the correct calculation because we have consumed this much of the buffer before we even started. So at this particular time, we calculate the time, the percentage of the time uh, now and the start back, push the this minus the start time plus the pushback, and we divide it by our, our time, and we get the correct measure for how trouble we are. And when we do that, we say, wow, this project is deep in the red on day one. We better put all of our resources on it to try and recover it. It gives you the appropriate measure of uh, a priority within your total buffer management system. And then if you complete five days worth of work in five days, the buffer, the, the warning automatically starts to correct itself. It didn't go straight across, but it started diving towards the green because your aggressive estimates were getting you there. 
So this is a very special case which happens from time to time. Part of the biggest advantage of visual project management is managing the resources that you have and how much work they can do at any particular moment in time. I talked about having less than 10% of your projects in the red. I said four out of that 20 was too many. If you really, if you'd like to get less than 10% in the red, if you can't get 10%, if you have more than 10% of the red, you need to choke back and stop releasing new work until you get it down to things in the green. That's how you be predictable. But it's a little harder to, to deal with that, so let me explain just a little bit. If you're in a manufacturing society and you have a, and making things, you have a machine. And if you have a machine that can put four, four uh, parts per day, uh, why would you give it 10 parts per day? Just wouldn't do that. Well, even a machine that can do four parts per day, sometimes it has setups involved, sometimes it has maintenance problems, sometimes it has idle time because there's no operator there to turn it off or on. Uh, and then it may have some real excess capacity. So if we consider that any process, whether it's a machine or a person, has working time where they're effective and then they have to eat dinner and they go to the bathroom and all that stuff, talk to their friends, and then they have some real extra time. If we think about that, we, we can see that a person has so much capacity and we should try and use it all, right? Well, no. Uh, it's very clear from queuing theory and from Little's law that you, the amount of work you give a person is the flow time of, that it takes to get through the system is proportional to the amount of work you give a person. It's basically easy to say the time it takes to get through a queue is proportional to the time that the server on the end is busy divided by the time they're not busy. So here's a little table that builds some numbers for you. If it's not busy, and if it's busy, it's not busy at ever, then it's, the service time will be zero. You'll just get poof, you go right through the line. If it's busy 40% of the time and not busy 60% of the time, then the service factor will be about 0.7. If you're 50-50, that would be 50% on the top and 50% of the bottom, then the factor is one. If you skip up, to 70% busy, the factor goes up to 2. If you skip to 80% busy, the factor goes to 4. You go to 90% busy, factor goes to 9. And if you get to 95% busy, it's about 20. So it looks like that. In other words, if you want your system to go and flow, you cannot overload your individual resources more than about 75%. If you do, you're jamming up the system. Most of you drive around on the freeways in large buildings, in large cities know that already. They have cameras on the on-ramps and they keep track of how many, how fast is traffic going. And as soon as the traffic starts to slow down, those red lights go on and stop people from getting on the freeway because in the long run, it's better to keep the flow going than it is to jam it up and delay. So, in visual project management, once we have this system in place and allocate the resources to all these tasks, it's very easy to evaluate what the resource loading is on any category of resource. For instance, here we see the electrical technicians are 96% loaded. There might be many of them, but they're 96% loaded. Is that a good thing? It's in the red. That would mean no. <laughs> That's not a good thing because then we know that those guys are choking back or holding back the processes which were necessary to get our company making money. They're perhaps delaying by as, fa as much as a factor of two or three, taking three times as long to get the same amount of benefit we get out of a project. Do you want to, if you want to get your money now or do you want to wait for four or five months to get your money? Which would you rather? Well, if we choke back, we can get it much, much faster. The same with the mechanics. Now the drafting and publishing, those guys are down there and they're probably all right. If any resource is more than 100% loaded, that means they're in the black, which means we should immediately do actions to remove the overload from those resources. The way we can do that is look at maybe uh, the projects which is, has, hasn't consumed any buffer at all, that might be one to freeze. Or maybe one that just barely started, let's take it out of the system, let's reduce the workload on those key individuals, otherwise we're going to kill our company by having too much overload. 
Now, the good news is there's a free version of this application already available on your iPhone. So if you get your iPhone out, you can go to the App Store, and there it is, Visual Project Management Lite. And this project really works good for individual projects. The, the, uh, what you get is you get your individual projects. You can watch those, and you can, uh, this is a group project on the left with different projects underway. And here's an individual project with its particular tracking. This one's in pretty good shape. It's great for a person who's one person who's managing a lot of projects and they want to keep them all on their phone and they can get status on when things are completed. Works pretty good. Coming very soon will be the full up version, which was the one that gives you the organization, all the projects there, and it adds things like the names of the, the, the organizational uh, director the, who's responsible for all these projects. Uh, then you can say, well, we also have uh, John, we can call, if you push this button, you can get John and find out what he's doing. You can click on that one and take it over to the project and says, well, this is project 433. Here's what it looks like. These are all the tasks that it has left. This one has a firm predecessor, and these people are there, and here's the project manager for that particular thing. We, can have for, we could email Mike and say, push on that button. You get him a, a text message or a phone call or whatever, email, and say, uh, Mike, what's happening on the... Uh, the test electronics interface program. And, or you can click on that test electronics interface program, see that it's assigned to a electrical tech grade three who happens to be Mike, and you'll see all of his workload. And you'll see that he has two projects in the red, two tasks in the red associated with these other two projects. So most likely he's not going to get to your project for a while. So don't, don't get too excited. Uh, we can talk to Mike a little bit more detail by getting his phone text and so on. All of these things are helping us to communicate clearly only the things that matters when it's necessary and not bother people except at the time when they're necessary. If we select on any particular project, we can go back to that, that project plan. You turn your, mic, your phone sideways, you can see all the detail. You can select on a project, see the detail of the project. You should be able to select the, the network and see the whole network analysis. And you select on any resource and you should be able to see how it fits in the resource plan. So all of those things are good because they make project management so easy. You can do it. You can reduce the flow time of your projects by half. And you can complete twice as many in the same amount of time, which means if you're in the project world, the amount of money you generate goes up. And we're not using any more resources. We're not using any more time or expense. So your profits are going to shoot through the ceiling. And as well as that, your customer is going to be happy. You're going to be predictable, so you can actually charge more because you deliver on time. All that becomes a very, very good improvement system. What would happen if all of those buildings in Chicago could suddenly become even 10% more productive? If they're only making 5% now, they could double their profits if they were 10% more effective. What a clever idea. Hope you can find visual project management valuable. Cost accounting and all that stuff that happened around the 1900s with GM and, and their vehicles, uh, the mid-level management group started becoming more and more important. Because of the mid-level management group, the bottom at the worker level has become the most efficient people in the world. The United States still leads the world in efficiency per, per man unit at the bottom, primarily because of the effectiveness of these mid-level managers. The cost of mid-level managers has now become more, uh, more so probably than the cost of the workers, just because that's the nature of business. The mid-level managers makes things go. The difficulty is that those mid-level managers' time is becoming more and more limited, their ability to concentrate on the things which need to be done. And particularly when it talks about project management, because these guys are doing projects. And in projects, there's a lot of difficulties. And you need to do it right to become very efficient and effective. So what is a project? Well, as a project is something that you do so that somebody else can do something else. In other words, you do it so that you can help somebody else do something else. It's an intermediate part. It's, if you think about it, it's a small segment out of a supply chain. 
So we build a house so that people can live in it. We make a radio so people can listen to the news and so on. And all those things that I've got listed there, bridge to get on the other side. We process insurance claims so that we receive our restitution and we run for public office so that we can improve the world. Yep, that's why they do that. And uh, we need to test, uh, treat a patient so they'll have good health. All those things are projects. In fact, they're everywhere. If you're in any big city in the United States and you look upside of those big, tall buildings, what do you think they're doing in those buildings? Are they doing mass production? Are they making cars or widgets or radios? Probably not. They're working on things which are projects things which go from one person to another to another, and there's a lot of people working together to make something happen. You ever had an insurance claim, you know there's a whole bunch of people involved. As to know their status of their work, to know if they're doing good or not, and they need to know when and where to go to get help to do their work. And right now, at least, there's a lot of people who are out there who would love to take jobs at that level and just get things done and have some good employment. So there's not a shortage of either the top or the bottom. There's lots of people who would like to be the CEO. There's like to pe a lot of people who can work at the bottom. But in the middle is the difficult group. It's the management group. It's the group who decides how do we get all the workers to go in the direction that our CEO wants us to go. So they have to decide how to make that thing work, what to do, when to do it, and particularly when to give help. So the workers on the bottom need to know when to ask for it, the worker, and the workers in the middle know, need to know when to give it. We notice that these people are focusing on resources, money, time, energy, schedules, and in the long-term trend and of the system. The mid-level management has become a problem. When it was first invented, when there was cost. As a result, it's my belief that really most everybody is doing projects. If you're not doing mass production, you're doing projects. And these projects have uh, difficult skills with them. You know, to an outsider, a project is kind of strange. It's sort of like a black hole. You put your project in there, and then sooner or later it comes out. Here's a man who says, I'd like a house. He has a vision of what he wants. He turns it over to the people who are developing it. And over time, the system develops and develops, and sooner and sooner and later, the product comes out. And sometimes it's not exactly what he wanted. Customer's a little disappointed, particularly not happy, but at least he's got something that came out of the big black hole. If you work in the black hole, it's a little different. There's usually two types of people in the black hole. There's the angry, mean project managers, the ones with the frowny faces along the top, and they have colored faces. That's, that's different colors come from depending on how long you've been holding your breath because you're Hello, this is Dr. James Holt with Washington State University's Engineering and Technology Management Program. I've been very concerned about helping organizations get to become effective organizations for quite a long time. And I've arrived at a situation which I call visual project management. In other words, how can we see how to get things done? You know, first of all, I'd like to review before we get into the solution what organizations look like. At the top of the organization is the leader, the CEO. This guy is up the top. His role is to set the vision for the company and then convince everybody else in the company that that's the way that they should go and motivate them to achieve those goals. Now, the CEO is in a pretty important position, but the direction they go is the one that is important because it's going to take the whole company. On the other side of the scale is the guys at the bottom, and these are the guys that do the work. And their job is, is to do the work in the order that it's been assigned, and they need 